You guys are too easy on Wow, okay. <laughs> I mean, you came to a seminar for some reason, unless you already know how to do it. I mean, you want to buy real estate, I'm making that assumption right off the bat. Like, we're not here debating whether we should get a 401k, or maybe you're diversifying from your 401k, perhaps. Um, so I'll make my intent pretty clear. My intent is to motivate you to buy real estate. Obviously, I'm a real estate broker, but more than that, I really believe in the product that that we all like, which is real estate. And so I do it for a living. I buy it, sell it, rent it, manage it. And I don't believe in stocks. I'll just personally say that. I feel like it's too much of a game. And I feel like this coronavirus really revealed to me how much of a game it is. Like, the scare comes out and immediately the stock market drops 35%. And we're like, we're still breathing. We're still in our house. But you just lost 35% of your savings like in two days. And then, some good news happens on the television, all of a sudden it goes up another 10,000 points. You know, it's, it's just all over the place. So, I uh, guess what happened to my real estate during that time? Nothing. It went up a little bit. It, it actually went up a little bit in that same amount of time. You know, the townhomes we had actually went up $6,000 in the same time period, which was, which was a 2% increase in price. So, um, just big differences in real estate. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about. So um, I'll be clear. <laughs> Should you buy real estate? <laughs> this is kind of, kind of the way I feel about it. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. And, um, um, you know, so we're going to answer some of the questions as far as like, well, is this the right time? I know I should buy, but is, is this still a good time considering everything that's going on? And, and some things you need to also answer is, is the right time for you and what you're looking to do personally because that is a huge factor, right? Like, can you afford it? Do you have the money? So, um, but let's say right now you want to buy, I'm going to ask you, so right here, we're, we're basically uh, looking at two fundamental approaches. One is, do you want to be the real estate expert, the landlord, and the handyman? Or, do you want someone else to do it for you and still get a good return? I mean, I, fundamentally, that's, that's kind of what you've got to decide, is whether you're flipping, whether you're purchasing, do you want to do it, or would you still like to invest and have someone else do it? And so with that uh, framework, I want you to consider that as we talk. We can help you with both. We, we have a program where we can partner with you and totally do it for you. You would just uh, help buy it. Or two, you can totally do it. And we'll, we can give you resources, we can give you leases, like we can really help you out and, and facilitate you. But we're hands off as far as like, you know, going, checking out the dishwasher when it breaks in. That's you. Okay, so here we go. Um, so we call, we, as realtors, we call this Rise Utah Realty. And as partners, we, we're calling it Rise Utah Partners. Um, just as a comparison, when you think about doing things. As partners in this comparison, what we're talking about is basically you come in with capital, you get the loan, buy the property, and then we become partners, and then we do all this. This is big stuff. I, I think mo most people don't realize is how much time it takes to manage a property, especially when you're getting it going, especially if you're doing rehab and stuff like that. It really is very time consuming. Of course, if you have the time, the skill, and the means, totally should, you should do it, but if you don't, that's what we talk about. But um, with our expertise, we can typically do things faster and better. Um, let's go into the market. We want to talk about the market right now and answer some fundamental questions. So what I want to answer right now is, let's just talk about the coronavirus because, you know, it's that big obvious thing. It's, it's totally changed the market. Um, this is total cases in Utah is surged to 15,839. Still out there. I know uh, our fear of it is not as high, but it's still out there. It's still growing, and we're still. What, what's our uh, color? Orange. Orange. Orange or yellow? Yeah. Anybody? See, no one even knows. <laughs> no one knows. It's okay. So it's, I believe depends, it's yellow. I think it depends we, on location. Because we were we were talking about going to green, which means basically we have no restrictions. But right now, like. We can't really have a football game yet, and that's what everybody wants to know. Is BYU Utah going to play this year? Because that's all. It's really important. That's all that matters. 
BYU so, is going to lose even if the Utes don't show up. <laughs> I'm getting yeah. frustrated. It would be the one year if they were going to win, they don't play, right? right. <laughs> Go figure. So, um, with that said, I mean, uh, coronavirus really is the big important thing to understand what's going on because it's what's lost all of our jobs. And that's what's really making everybody scared. It's what's dropped the stock market. And jobs are what drive real estate. You don't have jobs. You, are you going to buy a home if you don't have a job? No, you can't even qualify for a loan. So you have to have jobs. So when we've had low unemployment, because employment's so low, people feel good about their futures, and that motivates them to buy things, to invest, to get a new car. You know, when things are unstable, what do we do? We tend to hold back. We'll wait till we upgrade something. We'll stick with our same old computer. We won't upgrade our iPhone. And... We're definitely not going to upgrade our house this year. You know, that's what you do when you're scared, and and when you obviously when you lose your job, you know, now you're just struggling to keep your house. So th that's the fears that are out there. And those are the obvious fears, but l let's just see more here. Did you did you hear this report that came out? It was by uh, what was it Moody's uh, Analytics. Uh, they, they looked at the United States and they said this, and th this is actually a repost, it, it posted to, uh, syndicated to a lot of different, uh, all the different news sources, but it says Salt Lake and Provo are women most likely for fast recovery from the pandemic. And... Like that's out of t top 10 cities in the U.S. In the country. Yeah, yeah the country. That's, that's everybody. So basically Salt Lake County, Utah County, fastest to recover, top 10 in the U.S. Yeah. And so when we say, so they actually said, yeah, Provo and Salt Lake, but we know if they say Provo, is Warm included in that? Yeah. Is Lehigh good? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, actually, like, the economic epicenters are Point of the Mountain. Actually, technically, still today, the ep economic stronghold of Utah is Orange Provo. BYU UVU is a vast amount of income that comes in from those properties well beyond the uh, the techs right now although techs get a lot of the excitement and all that it's really those those provide all you know 70,000 students coming into the state and then those students stay here like there's always a percent that stay here and want to live here and then they start Qualtrics <laughs> they, they start uh, you know 100 contacts. contacts what else uh, podium uh, <laughs> Domo, I mean, those are those are all people that didn't live here, but they started businesses because they got an education here, and they said, "Hey, Utah's kind of nice." And guess what? There's a lot of talented people that we could hire here, and we can pay them less than they do out in uh, Silicon Valley too, because cost of living is cheaper. So that's kind of what's driving it, and it stabilizes our. It's not just stabilized. It's it's made our market grow because of the entrepreneurship. And what happens when people move here, they have a job, they feel good about the place, they now need a house. And so our growth rates have been extremely strong and that's what's pushing all of this new construction. And so, uh, in fact, we have 620,000 people that live in Utah County, about double that in Salt Lake, it's, it's about 1.2 million. And those numbers are going to double in the next 15 to 20 years, they're estimating. So imagine, like I, I kind of visually say, imagine like Utah County, and then just double the number of houses. Like where would you put them? Um, Saratoga. Oh, this one. Yeah. <laughs> Saratoga, Saratoga would be like Provo <laughs> in 20 years. That's, that's, what, that's what that means. Like, and, and Provo is going to be a little more vertical. And so that, that's just the natural progression of all real estate. And so what, what makes real estate value is that it's finite. It, there, you just can't make more land up. And what makes our real estate more valuable is that it's even more finite because we have water in the middle. Like you can't, like you're probably not going to drain the lake. And then you have a mountain, which is very difficult to build on. And if it's national forest, you can't build on it. So, um, and in fact, we're actually compared to Silicon Slopes in that same or Silicon Slopes is compared to uh, Silicon Valley for the same reasons because uh, you know they're in they're in the Bay Area and so in the middle they have a bay 
And then around them they have mountains. So there's, there's like this 10 mile strip of land where they can build. And that's why prices, that's one of the main reasons why prices have got out of control there because you had all these tech companies concentrated. They're competing for talent. They raise the wages very quickly. And then they build and then they hit those defined barriers. And then just supply demand takes over and they got they get charged more for rent and they get charged more for housing. And it's just a natural thing. And, and to some extent, we're experiencing that here. So one out of five jobs in Utah is in tech. But 80% of them are at the point of the mountain. Like within 10 miles of the point of the mountain, 80% of all tech jobs in the state. That means proportionally, we're disproportionate uh, as far as our talent pool to this. Like, you know, raise your hand if you have a neighbor that works in tech. You know, a lot of people do because because we're concentrated. It's not they talk about those numbers at one in five, but they're talking about the state. But the fact is, they're they're here, and guess what? The average salary for those guys is double the Utah average. It's one hundred eight thousand dollars a year, as opposed to like fifty six thousand. What is that going to do to real estate? Well, it's unfair to teachers, I'll be honest. It's unfair to policemen. It's unfair to anybody who's not in tech. Hey, come on in. Good to see you, everybody. Good to see you. But it's happening. We can't stop it. In fact, you know, it's just, it's just the natural forces. It's going to happen. Might as well understand what's happening and try and take advantage of it. So. If you're wondering if prices can go up, the answer is yes, because there are a concentrated number of people who are making enough money to support the values. And there's enough jobs that's moving people here. You know, one of our number one recruit states is California, and we all know that they paid a lot more for their house over there. So they come here and you tell them the house is only 400, they're like, so cheap, right? We can totally afford this. This is, and it's double the size of my other house? I only had a 1,200 square foot place in, uh, you know, in San Jose, and wow, 2,800 square feet, what a bargain. Let's go 5,000, that's what they do, right? And they pay cash for it. So that's, that's just the trends. And, and, and really, because of that, um, um, they say this, we're going to pull out. Oh, well, I, I kind of got ahead of myself, but this is what they wrote. This is what they wrote, right? We were, we were actually the number one economy in the United States, this area, prior to COVID hitting. That's huge. I mean, that's like pretty amazing. We have a highly skilled and educated workforce, a vibrant tech hub, relatively low cost of living compared to what they said, the Silicon Valley. And, uh, and people, they also mentioned this, it was interesting, people may reconsider where they live after this whole COVID thing. Like, you know, like, I don't know if I like New York anymore. Like, maybe we should go somewhere a little more rural so that, I don't know, we're safer. Or we could afford a, a fourth bedroom so that I can work from home if it ever happened again. You know, because working out of, a, like, an apartment in New York is not the funnest. With your dog barking when you're on your webinar, right? <laughs> Excuse me. Shh, shh, shh. Okay. So, um, I, I find the mindset of Utah is a little different about COVID. And I, and I want to talk about this because I do think it affects the way we view the economy. The way we view the economy is how we're going to, how the real estate market will react. What's your general feeling about the coronavirus? I see one of you is wearing a mask. What that tells me is that you're probably not scared of dying today. My wife's a nurse practitioner. So you get me more cash. Yeah. You, you can't get it because then she can't work, you know. <laughs> Was I, was I a little too dramatic there by saying you're not scared? You're probably cautious, but you're not like really deathly scared of it. Like none of us want to get it, but you know, I, I clean, I, I keep, you know, we keep our enough distance. We can still enjoy the outsides. We can still shop. We can still those things. Just wash your hands, you know, and watch your kids. You know, that's kind of that's kind of the way we're playing it right now. But we're not 100% like, don't go over to their house because they're going to get sick yet. And I, I find some of those, those, that's kind of our general thing. And so as soon as, like they said, you can go to work, like we were all excited to work again. 
and that excitement, that motive, that lack of fear, but motivation to provide and to work and to be industrious is really what's going to help us to, to pull out of this slower economy into a faster growing one. Now, if you disagree with anything, please raise your hand. No? Was that scratching your account? It was a scratch. <laughs> okay, we're good. I'm with you. All right, so let's talk, let's talk actual numbers now, okay? So 17 is the median days on market. That means half the homes get under contract in, um, in 17 days or less. This is then, for May. This is for the month of May, yeah. They have June yet, June, not over. But uh, it's our median home price. Um, down from uh, 18 days last May. So a year ago, when there was no, you know, it's kind of normal market going. Well, it, was, it was actually considered a hot market last year, right? We're actually selling homes fat, one day faster. That may, may not sound like much, but that's that's like a six or seven percent increase. Is that um, 153 total square foot or per finished? Do you know? It's total square foot in Utah they count unfinished basements in those numbers. Okay. So that's the price total square foot of the house. Um, median price, so we're up eleven thousand dollars in price from last year. Um, home sold, three thousand eight hundred seventy two. This is this is a big one that we're seeing a drop in now. Uh, today so so that was down twenty two point seven percent. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit on this one a little bit more in another slide. And these are single family and multifamily, um, down about that 22% as well. So instead of selling four homes, we're selling three. So definitely there's a hit there. Um, active listings is down 16.2% from last year. And under contracts is actually up. So there's more homes under contract now, even though there's less listings. A little ironic. So let me let me talk about this. So. This is um, a daily dot of new listings. Now, why do we talk about listings? Because listings are kind of like the lifeblood of real estate. You've got to have new listings because they're always the new homes for people to buy. You stop that, eventually you sell out and you know, we can't buy or sell homes. So we look at the number of listings. The more listings, you eventually get more sales. So you have to have listings to get sales. So in this, the blue is this year, 2020. And so this is the beginning of the year. This is not an annual, but it's the beginning of the year. And the orange is the beginning of the year, day per day, following the trend. And what, what is uh, the trend? Is So this would be like winter time. And then, you know, March, it's like that spring uh, rush for homes. You start to see the listings go up. Um, and right here, right about the time everyone was going to get excited to go buy a new home, March 13th, I remember, they told our kids there was no more school. So we were hearing the news reports right over here at March 13th, man, no school, all canceled. And then all of a sudden it was like, just tumbled from there, like, uh, what was next? Basically, they said first two weeks. it was like no church for, you know, and no, no gatherings and no... Or NBA basketball. I was that's my that's my sport. I love to watch it. Um, so so despite all that, we kept we did see start to see an increase, and we kind of plateaued. About a month later, we were plateauing, and now we're seeing kind of this decline. These are listings, but we're seeing increase where we saw increases before. What's the little bump between? Is it like? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Like most people, like around here, we typically don't list houses on Sundays because most people aren't working, so you'll see dips in that. So it's just kind of weekly, but you'll see it very consistent. So if you averaged it out, it would be smoother. Good question. All right, so that was listings, and what happens to the listings? You get offers, and that's under contract. So again, blue or bluish purple here is this year versus last year. So we saw a clear difference. In fact, we saw a 22% decrease in number of listings. But what do we see about under contracts? This is the interesting part. Skyrocket. They're higher. So what do we make of that? What is it telling us? 
We need low. more listings. The inventory is too We low. need more listings. Is, yeah, that's an obvious thing that's out there is getting snatched up. So exactly. So what's happening is that when when you look at real estate, it's a it's it's not people talk about the market slowed down. I said, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean total sales slowed down. Okay, so a lot of times people connotate sales decreasing with price drop. No, no, no. Any market, any free market is about supply and demand. So it's not how many homes you sell, it's how many buyers did you have for the homes that you were selling. So if you had 10 homes and 20 buyers, they're going to compete for those 10 homes. And 10 people are going to be out of luck. So it tends to push the price higher. But if you had 100 homes and 200 buyers, it's, it's the same percentage difference. It's just uh, it's the same problem on a bigger level. So you, you always have, it, it's about the balance of homes, not the total volume. And what we saw is that although the, the number of homes decreased for sale, it was that initial fear of coronavirus, like I don't want people coming through my house, touching things, they're going to give me the virus and I, and I can't afford that. So a lot of the, what we call the optional movers, uh, kind of backed up for a second. And it was those people who had the move or weren't scared or you know, had a job change, they, they need to move still, that, that were moving forward with it. But apparently, there were still more buyers than their sellers. And that's why we saw the medium home time go down, even though our listings were down 22%. Like, I guess they're just settling for the homes. <laughs> well, I guess you're good enough, we'll, we'll buy you. <laughs> Does that make sense? Do you guys have questions about that? Because that's, that's a big point here. So here, here it is on a uh, monthly basis, that same idea of under contracts. And what is really interesting about this is that these are the last four years. So 2016, 17, 18, 19, and 20. I guess that's five years, excuse me. But um, we're seeing irregularities, irregularities here. And a lot of that's due to the coronavirus in April, the, the max, the peak of the fear. And then as we we got fatigued and a little tired with staying inside, and maybe more reports came out saying it wasn't quite as deadly as we thought, people started to open up about that, and you quickly see this built-up reserve of people just rushing out there and grabbing homes right now. And so look look at this that like we've far ex we've ex like the highest peak of the last five years. In all five years, we've seen 8 to 10 percent growth every year. We are currently significantly higher in under contracts than we were in previous years. Do, do you have a feel if that increase is based on families buying homes they're living in, or is it investment properties, or is it hard to it, say? It doesn't discern that. Like, I don't know what's what. You know, the, the challenge is, is that it really doesn't matter because you're competing either way. You're just competing with other buyers. And as the seller, mostly you're just concerned about your total price. What are you going to get out of the house? And if you can get hired to selling to an investor, most people will. Um, uh, again, back to the coronavirus. This is off market. So what happens is people take their house off the market. We saw a large number of people taking their house off the market because of uh, fear of getting sick. And so March 13th, look at this twist where this is 2019 where we typically see off markets go down because as the spring market gets hot you'd automatically see off markets go down because people are really excited about buying the homes but instead they went up but remember the contradiction is that even though off markets are going up we're buying everything that is available and we're buying it faster so this is our sold graph so even Right here is the, this blue purple line is, even though it's lower, it's not about that, it's about the balance ratio. And we're lower mainly because we just had 22% less listings to buy. But again, of what was available, people are buying it up pretty quickly. So how are we having more houses going under contract every day, but then less sales? So a greater percentage of the homes that are listed are being uh, purchased. There's also a lot that are falling out of contract. The lenders got really picky 
because you know all the t politicians were saying, "Hey, twelve months free." The lenders are like, yeah. "Wait, what? Like, you can't just not have us make money." And so they were being very strict on their lending. Yeah. So there were some. There were like you know the week before right. pulling credit again, making sure you had a brand new pay stub. Like, right. I closed on a property like in April, like the worst time, and they were like, "Oh, by the way." Here's like 10 new things you have to get us before our funding. Like, I had satisfied everything they wanted. And they said, now these are pre-funding requirements. And pre funding like, we don't usually do that. Usually you do final underwriting and then you're clear. And I had, like, as a realtor, I had to show them, are you still in business? I had to show them, like, my under contracts. You have to show paint. You have to I had to show, show my receipts. I had to show my receipts and verify the name to my business to back to me. You have to show income within the last 10 days. Yeah, so income within the last 10 days. So if you, I guess I'm out of luck, but I only close like one every month. You know, it's a freak. <laughs> so, but, but that becomes a challenge for some people, and that's caused the increases in um, cancellations and other things. So uh, they just came out with a study, and again, this the guy who did this does, he works at the University of Utah, and he, he does most of the reports they, they do on television. but. His predictions were that um, this total volume of homes is going to decrease by about 8 to 10 percent this year. Like, this is projections now, like how the year will end. Home prices should go up still 5 percent. Not bad. Yeah. I wouldn't mind actually 5 percent every year as opposed to like 8 to 10. 5 percent is good. 10 is too fast. Yeah, to 10, yeah. The Salt Lake Board of Realtors at the start of this year said they anticipated multifamily pricing to go up between 10 and 20% this year alone, pre-COVID. Because, because of the, the price range, because our townhomes and condos are so expensive now, they're having to go to these apartments, they're switching to condos. Yeah, yeah so we're seeing a full recovery, or we're not going to see a full recovery, but we're seeing recovery going strong, positive job growth into the fourth quarter. Um, unemployment, they think it'll stabilize at about 5.3. That's not really terrible. We were at the lowest unemployment possible before at just under 3%. So, and uh, honestly, interest rates, they are, they're like uh, putting some gasoline on the fire. Anyone hear about lower interest rates? What did you hear? <laughs> they're awesome. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're like low, right? They're low, and they're probably only going to get lower. Uh, I'll give you an example of why they'll get lower. Your, your, uh, we have a lender in here. Ryan, what's, what's, in, what's a good interest rate today? So like, on a primary uh, residence, I just wrote up a loan that was a 2.875, uh, no cost. So the lender covered all of the closing. Uh, the investment property rates we're seeing right now are about a 20% down or right around 3.99 on a really good scenario, up around 4.5 on an average scenario. Okay, so let's talk about this. A lot of, uh, there's the federal funds rate, which is um, the base rate that the government kind of sets for, the, for all interest rates. It doesn't necessarily dictate what the mortgage rates are going to be, but it definitely influences it on, on treasury bonds and stuff. So they're basically at zero, and they're giving money to banks. So basically most of what you're seeing is what's called yield. So you have, you have an interest rate the bank gets the money for, and then they have a basically their profit margin that they charge back to you. During the coronavirus, banks, until things stabilize, they're concerned right now about defaults, defaults on rent and on mortgages because of a lot of the political talk about people, it's okay not to pay your mortgage. That kind of freaked lenders out for a second and they didn't want to give money. So what that did is it skyrocketed the yield. And that's why you're seeing such a large difference because most people aren't going to default on their primary but they would let an investment go if push came to shove, like you're going to let your investment go. That's why we're seeing higher. But as things start to stabilize, what they're, what they're predicting is that the yield is going to go down, or that margin, sorry, the margin, not the yield, the margin is going to go down, and uh, which will gradually decrease that rate to make it, make it much better. So uh, we're, 
the anticipation of rates is not that they're going to get worse. In fact, they're going to get better once once people figure out the direction of the economy and once they have more confidence in recovery, the margin will go down and our our rates. Right. So the the thought in the industry right now is. If we were under a normal market with normal circumstances, the actual interest rates on like the primary residence would be around 2.25%. But that nervousness of the banks, they're building the extra margin and protecting themselves from the unemployment and, and worst case scenario. But that, just as David said, is, is it calms down just a little bit, we're seeing the rates continue to go towards that. Yeah, the fund, federal funds rates at zero, the only thing you're really being charged is that margin by the bank. Because the yield is, Zero, right? So they're gonna banks are. It's kind of a good business. We should be in banking, man. Get the money for free and then charge somebody three percent. That makes that's good. Every big city wants to sign on top of the building. It's a bank. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there you go. So that's that's about interest rates. So I've had a lot of people ask me, and actually uh, the predict the prediction because they don't feel they feel like a lot. Of, we all know that interest rates stimulate a market so this is not the time to raise interest rates because it would it wouldn't help the, the overall situation and in election years Republicans, Republicans want a good market that's all I can say they really want the market to be strong Democrats would benefit if it wasn't but push comes to shove Trump has the power over the Federal Reserve and he's going to make the interest rates low and I think honestly it benefits everybody to have them low right now because it's not just about um, what I was saying, it's not just about mortgage, it's about credit cards, it's about um, having money to start a business still. And that's what the Federal Reserve is doing is they're funding all the banks. That's a big difference because in the last drop they didn't fund the banks to help bail them out. They allowed the, mar they allowed the uh, you know, people to pull out money and then the banks started to fail and that kind of cascaded everything. But there was obviously there was a lot more corruption. See, this, this isn't corruption. We're not dealing with corruption like we did last time. We're just dealing with a virus. It's more like a tsunami hit us. And, and like most disasters, you try and get back to normal as fast as you can, but you still have to rebuild your house. It just takes time. But, but it's totally, totally different. So um, let's yeah, focus on the that's best. That's probably the biggest myth, too, is that rates are going to go down like it did last time because they think COVID's going to take it down like the last market. It's a totally different market. Yeah, it's a totally different market. I, I can't tell you how many people told me, even over the last five years, I'm just going to wait till it crashes again. I'm just going to wait till it crashes again. Okay, well, wow, you're going to be in this Keep apartment waiting. a long Keep time, time, man. Keep you know, and, and 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 since then they've lost how much in equity they could have built. It's kind of sad. But because of the forces that I'm explaining to you, are they are real? They are happening, whether you acknowledge them or not. I'm just going to say they're going to happen. Um, I'm just, I'm, a, I kind of put my money where my mouth is, and we're buying six properties, just like right now, because of where we feel the market's going. Um, this was a poll. And look at look at people's feelings about real estate. This is America's top choice for long-term investments. Who here? Yeah, yeah. So, so it, does does anybody know anybody who is a millionaire because of four hundred one k? Does anybody know somebody who is a millionaire because of stocks? And I'll put in parentheses who's not the stock broker, <laughs> like the actual people they try and help, right? Or because they took their company public. Yeah. There was this story, there's actually a book that was written, I read it about a decade ago, but it was like, uh, it, the, these guys were sitting on this uh, Caribbean island, they're looking at all these beautiful yachts, and the guy was explaining, he says, you know what, these are all the yachts of the richest brokers in the world. And I gotta look back at him, he says, well, where are all the customers' yachts? And the joke is, well, the customers don't have yachts. <laughs> it's the brokers making all the money in the stock markets. And so they have this system set up to make a ton of money from you, a lot more than we do, unfortunately. It's kind of some of my mentality of why I don't invest in stocks. But another stat to follow with that is um, this one. I looked this one up. 
Anybody like to read? Kelly, you're good here. Sure. 90% of the world's millionaires have been created by investing in real estate. It's a pretty high percent. So 90% of realtors. That, that's not saying that 90% that of millionaires invested in real estate. No. 90% of people who became millionaires did it through real estate. 90%. And I'm gonna I'm gonna show you why those numbers are so powerful, why it's working for them. So uh, okay, so you're here. We're gonna invest in real estate. It's kind of like saying uh, I want to be a doctor. What's the next stage? Okay. Well, what kind of doctor do you want to be? Do you like children? Do you like geriatrics? You know, what kind of doctor do you want to be? Um, and so when you say I want to invest in real estate, okay, great. You know, there's a lot of products out there. Do you want to invest in land? Do you want to invest in apartment complexes? Do you want to be a developer? I mean, you know, the world's your oyster in real estate. So I want to say there's a lot of ways to do real estate. Most of the most, the most popular and publicized ways are is rehab clips. It kind of gets a lot of attention in, in um, you know, show, TV shows, right? Do you have a favorite one? Fixer upper. Fixer upper. Fixer upper. So, you, we've all become experts in real estate because we've watched those shows. <laughs> yeah, I, I always laugh as a realtor. I'm like, they like skip like 50 steps right there. <laughs> like they've skipped three months, 50 steps, and a thousand hours of work. Seventy percent of the world's bums have been created by uneducated investors in real estate. Okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, sarcasm is 70% true right <laughs> um, So, I'm going to tell you my methodology right now. And uh, it, is, it is fairly simple. Okay? It's not going to take you a long time to get it. I like residential. I find below average or below average properties. Right now, not always, but right now. Our best products have been townhomes and condos. Newer build, new construction on newer build, and in growing areas. Okay, so let me let me explain that. So uh, residential, the number one reason why you go residential versus multifamily is just how much money you got. Like, if you have millions of dollars, then you can buy a hundred units. But most of us don't. So if you got sixty to eighty thousand, you can buy. Uh, a residential. So that's that's typically why I'm in. That's kind of like I'm, I'm in minor leagues. So <laughs> but they're actually quite profitable. But we'll explain that. So why the average price? Well, have you ever seen the bell curve? Like in in economic disasters, high-end homes uh, typically get hit much much harder. But if you're in that area where most people are demand. For that house, you always have the highest demand for the products that we're buying. Highest demand for rent, highest demand for just buying or selling it. It's the highest demand. So by buying that medium price, it's it's where most people can fit. Um, townhomes. Uh, I I found something interesting in my studies, which is don't ever buy a three-bedroom townhome. Go four or, or three with a loft. You just have to have that little extra area. That's the key. Don't ever buy a two-bedroom condo. You can get $150 more in rent by having that extra bedroom. And guess how much that extra bedroom cost? Like five grand. Five extra thousand, like just go to that extra little bit. Mm -hmm. You can get $150 more a month in rent. It's up to 200 in some areas. So that's, that's the fundamentals. And, and I saw that as a property manager. I was like, huh, you know what? These are the exact same square footage, but yet I get 100 or 150 more for this. So it's just making those correlations. And then what we do also, the reason why we've gone with new construction is I can customize it to a rental. So I put the money where it's most important and, and don't spend it on a lot of fluff. Just like pretty straightforward. I also like, I know that people like new. Can you, like, what do you mean customize it to a rental? Um, I got a waterproof pad. So when your kid pees on it, or your dog, I say kid because I my kid did that once to my house. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you peeing in the corner? <laughs> you know? So uh, 
So whatever they do, so what happens is you can't, you, everything gets absorbed into the pad. You can't, you can't get it out. And so now if they pour something stain, that's, that's it. But um, it just helps with long term. Typically, what I'm trying to do is make my places pet friendly. With all the pet laws out there, like uh, <laughs> shaking his head, right? You can't fight it anymore. You just can't fight it. You have to just just accept it that you're, they're going to have pets in your house, whether you know it or not. They will have a pet in the house. I found out two hours ago, a pet in the house. <laughs> yes, and so there's comfort animals, which is very easy to get approval on. We've, I've proven it. There's online sites you can get that say it's a doctor. It looks legit. It's just BS. But, um, and, and there's also sympathetic doctors that may... I mean, everybody feels better with a dog. Duh! <laughs> I feel much better. Yo! Oh, hey, you're like my dad. You know, it's like... <laughs> good boy, good boy. You know, it's like your best friend, right? It makes you feel good. But um, there's just it, it just does havoc on your rental property. So try and find things that you just know. I mean, I took, so I took carpet out of my hole downstairs because it's like, I just know the dog's gonna run on. They're gonna use my carpet to clean their shoes. And, um, and then upstairs I have a waterproof pad. So it's like, it's, it's just trying to identify those things. You know, um, getting that extra bedroom because everybody needs that extra space for family or for work. Um, yeah, and also the flooring. I just did uh, level one uh, laminate flooring. You know, I didn't have to go to a grade two or grade three. It looks nice, but it's not. Here's another. This is a pro tip for you guys. It's not the quality of the of the stuff in the house. It's the color palette that matters the most. You could get all the cheap stuff, but. It, as long as it's gray with white cabinets right now, people will love it. If you have the finest wood molding on top with really soft Berber carpets and um, people are going to be, you know, people with soft closed cabinets and all that, people will look at it and say, oh, let me tear this out. You get the thickest granite that, that was like really super expensive, they'll be like, quartz and then it's the cheap you know three quarters of an inch quartz I'm telling you it doesn't I'm, color palette is more important than material qualities I've just as a realtor I take people in hundreds of homes over the last two years and I just watch people's reactions and I've just learned stuff from people it's all about the color man they don't like the color we, st we still have chosen things because like did the granite because we know like, they're going to set hot things on it versus the cheaper stuff. It'll last longer. And it was only like a thousand dollar upgrade. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> well, that's that's a pro tip I didn't, didn't tell you, but let me expound on that. If you're going to spend money on anything, spend it in the kitchen. It's the wow factor. So, if you're going to get nicer cabinets, get it in the kitchen. Um, we did a, a mistake we made is we bought a home, an edge home. And uh, most people aren't getting uh, handles on the cabinets because you know they just kind of lift underneath. But the way they built the cabinets, you can't fit your fingers between them. So you need you need handles because it was just more like a it became an issue. If something becomes an issue, it's a problem. It's when they don't say anything that's when it's okay. They're not going to compliment you. They're just not going to complain. No complaint is good. That's how I property manage. No complaint is good. Awesome. If they if they tell you're awesome, then you've done you've exceeded your job as a landlord. Just just try and meet the. I know I I'm not saying we're average at all. I'm just telling like human nature is that they're not going to compliment you for giving them a house to live in. They're, but if if they say they like it, it looks nice, and they never call you again, mm, home run. I did it. <laughs> did it. Works perfect. So. Um, also, low maintenance. These things are basically very low maintenance for at least seven years or so. I was just going to say, to piggyback on your comment, don't don't project your tastes into your rental property. Like what yeah. I would want if I were living there, because that gets expensive and it won't recoup your ROI. Isn't that hard, though? I mean, it's so hard. Like, I come in, I'm like, oh, I would do this, and i got to fix this, and i get this awesome floor. And you're like, wow, I just spent a lot of money. 
<laughs> so you got to you got to remove yourself from the equation, and that's that's sometimes uh, it kind of hurts people honestly because some landlords are just. I'll tell you, most, most property problems always originate from the landlord. They get the wrong tenants. They don't, they don't service the tenants well. And um, I got a guy in my neighborhood, freaking landlord won't water the grass. Like we, everybody has a nice house, but since we have no HOA, there's this one house, dead grass. <laughs> Things in the yard, we're like, really? Come on. And um, so there's just bad landlords out there that don't take care of their properties. And they only fix things when they have to, and then they make, you know, it's just, I, 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 that's not how I landlord. I'm pretty proactive. You said townhomes are low maintenance. Can you be more specific about what makes them low maintenance? You want to take care of a yard. Yeah, a yard. Yeah. I mean, each HOA is does different. Come, it does come at a cost, so you yeah. do have HOA fees. Yeah. Yeah. So that goes into your own. But I've even done that, like, on some of my homes. There is no HOA, but I pay for the yard to be done because I don't want my neighbors complaining about my renters. Mm. And I just work that into the rent. Yeah. Mm. Um, <laughs> amenities have been a, a good one for us right now. And mainly because they're new. That's, those have been key, key features for us. I, I'm not buying old townhomes right now. Um, there's, there's different seasons for different times. And I've just sat down the last six months and I've kind of found a niche and it's working really well. Um, but, you know, if the market were to crash, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be doing like flips and doing other things that would probably uh, yield a higher return. But for right now, there's there's different times and seasons for everything. So there's no real flip product out there right now, though. It's, it's been super it's, tough. It's, Didn't you, you've done that, right? Uh, not many flips, no. Mostly fourplexes. Fourplexes, okay. Fourplexes are so expensive. They're ex really expensive right now. So, you guys, um, honestly, buying real estate is mostly just about buying it. People spend way too much. Okay, this is me. This is me. But I want to be. I want to be serious here. People spend way too much time trying to find the perfect property, like the diamond in the rough, the, the property that's twenty percent undervalued, and and they're going to make all this money on. Well, and the truth is, is think ten years ago. Which property would have been good to buy? Any of them. They all went up like a hundred thousand dollars in like the last five years. All of them. Yeah. So to a certain extent, it's like a tide, a tide going up. When the market conditions are right, it's going. Just get in the game. And too often we've been waiting. You know, even even if the market were to crash. The worst crash in the history of real estate happened 12 years ago. Does anybody know how much it actually crashed? Like, I know there were specific properties that got really hammered, but like, what was actually the average decline in price? 18 to 20 percent. It was like it was exactly it was, it was actually like 19.6 percent was the actual average crash value. How much have we been appreciating each year? Eight to ten, twelve in some areas. So what we're talking is about in two years we made up all losses in the worst crash. And how long? Oh, by the way, how long did it take to crash? It took five years for that price to go down nineteen percent, and then we recovered it in two years, and now we've exceeded everything. In three years we 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 hit back to the. Yeah, it was actually 2015 we hit the high, and then since 2015 it's been all new territory. So I'm saying it's like when real estate, when it is the most terrible market ever you could ever conceive of, it only went down 19%. And even then, most people still have their renters. They may get sound like there was a big problem, but what actually happened was the problem wasn't the renters, it was the leverage, and it was the corruption. And so too many people did stated income that couldn't afford the houses, and then they, they were the ones that lost the properties. Any good landlord still kept their renters. Yeah. They still cash flowed. People they didn't like go bankrupt. People still had to have a place to live. So. And then what they did is they kept their properties, and then they could refinance them at a lower rate when the Federal Reserve dropped everything to, again, lower again. So like saying, so even in the worst case scenarios, like just hold on, hold tight, and get out of it.
but so let me let me show two examples. We have an edge hunt agent in the house. Um, we I've I've been buying a lot of properties uh, from edge homes. Um, probably because they do have the most townhomes and condos, and honestly, I think they've had the nicest townhome for the price. It is more of a luxury townhome, and the condos. I mean, they're they're spitting them out like they're they're very duplicated. Like, not much variance in their condos. So you go to a community, there's like 300 people at the identical town or identical condo, but that's not really the point. The point is that it's a high demand product. People want it, and they're selling out of it. So that tells me that people want to live there. So I'm like, huh, kind of using like the logic here. People want to live there. High demand product, selling out, price going up. Probably be a good rental. It's in an area that people like. And so I focused on everything around the point of the mountain. Um, and in some cases, uh, visionary homes have some townhomes down in Spanish Fork that I have that new construction should be done in October that I'm eyeing on too. Because, again, we, for all the reasons I said before, and uh, cash was very similar. Just, it is cheaper down there, so you can we can buy a townhome for just under 300 we're up here, we're going to be more like 330-ish range, um, maybe up to 340. So that's kind of our price ranges. Uh, the handout that you got has all this in it, so it, it shows the layouts, but they're actually really good. Um, what, what we've been able to do is we, it has a fourth bedroom, typically it have this vaulted ceiling, and I said, you know, that doesn't really matter, it's really cool. I call it the sexy factor, like it looks nice. But our main thing is that we want functionality because that's more important to me, to people. So we get the fourth bedroom. Still has, what I like about them is there's nine foot ceilings. Um, so you have more headroom and, and more headroom feels more luxurious, feels more open. I put a ceiling fan in, little things, a little cooler, saves them energy. Um, and, uh, Tankless water heaters. What renter does not like, what person does not like never ending hot water? That's what that means. So I can get a lot of people in there that are never going to run out. That's kind of a selling point for me. You get a tankless water heater. And so you get the extra bedroom tankless water heater. Pickleball courts. We all love pickleball. We have a tournament champion in our midst of pickleball. We're <laughs> down to St. George. I saw on Facebook he had like himself first place podium doubles in pickleball. Um, but I don't want to be sarcastic, but um, that's that's kind of where we're at, and um, and we we can take advantage of appreciation without actually spending money. So we lock in on a contract, wait eight months, and all of a sudden we got thousands of dollars in equity, and all I did was put a deposit down. So the properties have been growing in value without any outline capital. Now once we start closing, we obviously fund it, but so. Let, before I, I'm going to show you a pro forma of a property, kind of how it works, but I want to explain to you the four ways in which you make money on rental properties. Most people know too, they, they forget the number two and three on this, okay? So cash flow. Anybody want to know or define that? What is cash flow on a property? Money in your pocket. Cap rate. No? Well, well it affects your cash flow. Yeah, it's, so yeah, so cash flow is just after all expenses, it's the money you keep. Um, it's, I'm not defining it by a return right now, I'm just saying that's what cash flow is. So, um, a lot of people misuse that. Usually, if they're telling you about their properties, they always tell you the gross income they're making, not the net income. So cash flow is... Net income after mortgage. I forget what the acronym is for that, but no, EBITDA or something. Oh. <laughs> but so principal pay down. What is this? Mortgage payment. Well, isn't it great that you can buy something somebody else and somebody else pays for it? Ha! Huh. What a concept. You can buy it as long as you can qualify. You buy it, someone else pays your bills. And guess what? A mortgage is made of two things, 
principal, and interest. Mm -hmm. And every year on a, uh, let me give you a scenario, about on a $330,000 property, the interest rate would vary in this, this number, but it's about $4,500 to $5,500 a year that they pay down in principal. So they pay your interest and then they give you $5,000 back. So um, you're making about $450 a month. And that is, that is a real return. Most people don't look at it because they're like, they don't have the money, so they don't think about it. All they know is that three years later they got a hundred grand and they don't know where it came from. Right? So in three years, technically under those scenarios, you have about $15,000 in equity. So if you're looking to pull cash back out of your property, that's where it becomes important. And I'll talk about portfolio building and how we do that, okay? But that adding up equity is seriously important to um, getting more properties. So we have cash flow is the cash in your pocket after all expenses are paid. Principal pay down, isn't it great? You can borrow money and someone else pays the bills. And you make about $5,000 in equity a year off of that. Okay? So that adds up to about a 5% return on top of what you're getting just for that. Tax depreciation. This is a little more complex and it's going to vary for people. Does anyone want to attempt to explain it? 27 and a half years you get to depreciate yeah. whatever. You want to say that just a little louder? 27 and a half years you get to depreciate the purchase price, not the land value. You have to take the land value out of that and put the home value. Yeah, so it's a write off. And so you if your house up. is worth Two hundred thousand. Your land's worth a hundred. You take the two hundred. You divide it by twenty-seven and a, and a half years, and so it'll give you a number. So let's. I don't even know what that number would be. Hundred thousand. <laughs> let's let's say it's two hundred and seventy thousand five hundred dollars. You know, five thousand dollars. Right. Divide it by twenty-seven point five. Ten thousand. And we get it's ten thousand a year. So, I I get a write off my income ten thousand. Uh, a year. So let's say I make $100,000, easy math, I write off 10000 so my taxable income is now ninety. Yeah. Let's say I pay, I don't even know what that is. What, 25%. Let's say 25%. So when I write off $10,000, I don't have to pay $2,500 in taxes. So most people don't count that because Again, it's it's they don't honestly they don't even track it. They just like here do my books and they just they just you know. It's about thirty six hundred dollars for every hundred thousand dollars. So thirty six hundred per hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So um, it's real though. It is real. You really oh, save that money. That's awesome. It and so this is where awesome. this is where a lot of politics come out. I don't want to bring up. Too much politics, but but this is a this is one of those political things where people say, well, why is this rich guy not paying any taxes? Because because rental property, man, because he's depreciating the asset. My brother bought millions of dollars in real estate and didn't pay taxes for like six years. He's a millionaire. Yeah, just be careful, because once you sell it, yeah. Yeah, but then they Yeah, but that's why we have 1031 exchanges. Yeah. You just roll it into the next property. You don't pay you don't pay taxes. So you seriously won't pay taxes on this income. That's the greatest thing about it. You're freaking making money, but you're not. Well, it's like investing you're, in your 401k pre-taxes. Like, there's a lot of programs like that. you start gifting it to your kids. There's lots of things that you can do to get it out of your taxes. So Real estate, so here's here's the point. Real estate ownership, tax laws are are in favor of real estate ownership. They just are. Tax laws are in favor of us buying real estate. And with all those tax advantages, well, it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense. Do you get that same protection when, you, when you're making um, $10,000 on stocks? Not at all. Zero, in fact. You don't get those protections. That's why the pilgrims came here. They wanted to get away from taxation from the big London. Now, I would, I would actually been. add a fifth to that because in a down market, when stocks tank, or if you have economic conditions where people can't afford expensive houses, they lose a job, 
they flood the rental market. Now you've got eight people looking for every unit that comes available, and by virtue of competition, your rental rates go up yeah. as well. Yeah. Last, last one, okay. Appreciation. I think everyone probably understands this one, but let me explain a little deeper. So, uh, how much did homes appreciate last year? Anybody know? Carol, do you know? I'll put you on the spot. Like in the last 24 months. Well, it actually varies per, per per area. It's typically different, but it was it was around eight percent. There were definitely areas over 12, but uh, and then million dollar homes not so much. But the uh, the average, like the average is a conglomerate of all housing, went up over eight. Over eight. So what is? So here here's here's the power of appreciation. So let me do an example. Um, I like easy math. We're gonna do easy math, right? <laughs> okay, hundred thousand dollar house. Okay, if it appreciates eight percent, what is that? Eight thousand. So what's my return on investment? Depends how much money you put down. Ah, uh, Carol, I didn't trick Carol. <laughs> it depends on how much you put down, exactly. Because most people misunderstand. Well, the market appreciated eight percent. I made eight percent. No, 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 no. Depends how much you put down. Okay, so if I bought this house with an FHA loan, how much did I put down on it? What's the minimum? Ryan, what's the, what's the minimum? 3.5%. Okay, so let's just say 3.5. So 3.5% on an owner-occupied property is $3,500. So if that's my investment, this is my turn. What's my return on investment? 200%, over 200%. So we're at a plus 200% ROI. You're kidding me, right? Over 200%. Like that doesn't even compute. Yeah, that's why you bought three years later, you, you used the equity and you got a bigger house because they don't understand the forces that are happening. They're just happening, and they kind of like little kids. They're oblivious of things. And just food's ready in the morning. Their clothes are folded in their drawers, and like it's all good. So these markets are happening. So what if what if we put uh, what if we did investment property, Ryan? What's what's the typical down payment on an investment? Twenty to twenty-five percent. What's the advantage of putting more down? Better interest rates. Lender would stake less risk. Yeah. So interest rates. It's all about risk. How much better if you put twenty-five percent down? It's actually significant. Uh, a half a percent, so a half rough percent. So you have to weigh out the cost. Number one reason for not doing that, simply just money. Like, so if it pencils with less, you should do less. But if it pencils with more, you, we have to consider that. But usually I run numbers at 20%. So what's what's 20% down of this? 20, uh, yeah, 20,000 down. And so has anybody got a calculator out there? Yeah. What's 8,000, what's 8,000 dollar Increase in price with only a twenty thousand dollar investment. Is it? Yeah, forty So that's a forty percent return on your investment. Just with the appreciation. So I, I have guys all the time that say, "Oh, you know, I believe in stocks. Like we tell the kids in stocks, stock market goes up faster than real estate market. We're going up at eleven percent. You guys only did seven. Nope. Like you don't understand real estate now, or tax benefits, or anything else." Because there's four ways in which I make money. As far as I understand, there's only one way in which you make money. How much money do you need to buy $100,000 in stock? $100,000. $100,000. How much money do you need to buy $100,000 in real estate? You can buy a margin. Oh, yeah. $20,000. So you need $20,000 to buy $100,000 in real estate. What? So you guys seeing this? How? Why 90% of all millionaires have made it in real estate, not made a million and then bought real estate. They made it in real estate because of this power of le we call this leverage. So, if you if you bought the property cash, would it be better than leveraging it? No, it wouldn't. So, if you buy it cash, you divide eight thousand by a hundred. What's your return? Eight percent. Percent, and they call that when you buy something cash and you get a return. Let's say that was your actual cash flow. 
you know, they call that a cap. That's where cap rates come in, or a capitalization rate. But um, I, that's, I don't, I, I personally do not have loans on anything. I have no car loans, no nothing. I pay credit card, credit cards off. But I will leverage real estate. Why? Because you can't beat it. They give you loans so cheap, and then you can charge rents, and then it appreciates. It's like it just it, it pencils, as we would say. It makes sense. Now, depending on your level of risk, you can leverage less. Um, but your typical so your sweet spot, like if you want to have more safety, you could put that 25% down, get the lower interest rate. You have a 25% equity, so if the market dropped, you could still, if you were forced to sell, you could still sell. But again, the chance of losing 25% of your home's value is very low, given the fact that it's only happened once in our country's history, and you know the conditions aren't the same today. The biggest risk you run is you get so excited about this that you leverage yourself too much, because you always need some cash flow to cover the water heater that needs to be replaced, yeah. the furnace, yeah. you know, things like that. So this is so the you need to you need to have a certain sweet spot of, of cash that you have on hand. And as you accumulate more properties, it's nice is that you know you're collecting ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars a month, and then all of a sudden they need a new roof. Guess what? I you know I have this money in the bank. I can fix this. I'm collecting it from everybody. Oh, they need a new furnace. Or you know things that just happen. Oh my, I have renters that I got to kick out. You know, I gotta pay the mortgage for a couple months. You know, you don't want to put yourself so financially tight that you can't overcome some of these obstacles. So, have you ever heard of a Swan account? It's a real special kind of account. It stands for the Sleep Well at Night account. <laughs> right? It's basically a reserve account, what banks would call it. It's nothing really special. It's just it's just money in the bank. So that's where you get in trouble. Buy too many properties using this leverage. One thing goes wrong, and now you're you can't you personally can't cover the mortgage because your renter didn't pay you. Because that's what happens when they don't pay you. So you need to strongly encourage you to have six months in reserve. This is not to me. It's not optional. If you're going to invest in real estate, you need that money. Okay. If you I want think to when you're starting out, you can do a little bit less because you're not quite leveraged. But if you have at least two to three months of rent or your mortgage payment in there. So when you say six months in reserves, that's not on your personal income. That is on... That's based off mortgage payment. So you look, at, you look at your monthly expense on the property, outgoing income. And I would just say, just get six months. Like, that's a healthy, that's a healthy amount. Could you do it on less? Yeah, it's just how much risk. How well do you want to sleep at night? Account. That's the question I'll ask you. Like, dude, you could you could do nothing. People do it, and they typically get away with it when the market's going great. Coronavirus hits. Governor says you don't have to pay rent. What? <laughs> it can go bad quickly when a virus hits. Like, who would have known? But you will sleep well at night, knowing that look, I've saved for my rainy day. It's here. I'm I'm okay. Now, the more properties you get. I, I don't rec I don't think you need six months. I think you need three is fine. Because what happens is that if you had ten properties, the conglomerate of ink, the reserves that you have, it's, it's like a bet. Chances are all ten properties aren't going to go out. But if you have the reserve account of ten combined, you can typically take care of easily two, three of them. No problem. So again, just to reinforce that, so back in the 2000s, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and we bought a 12-plex, and a 5-plex, and a 4-plex, and a 2-plex. And we bought super, like, 1920-type properties, and, and our, our numbers were just fantastic, and, on the, you know, we penciled them out, but they drove us into the ground, because we didn't have that reserve account. We were on the the S can account, the sleep crappy at night. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's that's really true. I'm actually having some post-traumatic stress syndrome back here uh, for, for doing it the wrong way. So, but, but there's also one more step, which is what the lender does require. So outside of buying it, they do require a certain amount of reserves, at least to be shown. Now, whether you apply it towards the property, 
What what is the typical reserve amount on a on an investment? Uh, it, it, like it depends your on your DTI. I mean, it's uh, say three to six months. Three to six months. So it's 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 part of qualifying as well. Yeah. So when you consider how much money you need to consider, the, look at the total cost outlay per month, and then times it by three or six, and that's what they'll tell you. Six is six is the safe number. You'll always be fine with six. At a unit, a thirty unit complex out in Kentucky, Morganville, Kentucky, and my bank came was like, "We need fifty thousand dollars with the stuff fixed," and I was like, "What?" That's quite a condition. <laughs> Glad I wasn't that one officer. <laughs> Jeez, ouch. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, because we had owned the property for three years, and then they came back with that. Oh, while well, you were already in it. No, we were already. Interesting. Did yeah. you did you do it? Did you? Yeah, we we started slowly doing well, it. Wow. So <laughs> because um, I had my reserve account. That a girl. So when you hear real estate horror stories, what are they mostly centered around? Lack of money, lack of cash. Lack of capital to fix things, to make things right. Like you have, to, you legally have to make things right with your tenants if something breaks. It's the wrong property. Uh, landlord issues, not not hire, not recruiting, or I say recruit, not not getting the right renter in there, so they're bad and they mistreat your property. Not following up with them to make sure that they are. Uh, Again, treating your property good, checking in, seeing the inside of the place, randomly stopping by. All of the problems exist because uh, of typically bad landlords and not enough capital. If you follow up, if you have a relationship with your tenants, and you, you, you wel I welcome issues. Why? Because I don't want the sink to drip underneath for four months before they tell me they didn't think it was a big deal. Now the bottom of the sink is all warped up because they were uncomfortable with calling me. It's, that's not the way to do it. Now it's it's much easier to say, you know what, that's not really a big deal. It's not. It's if you broke it. I can tell. <laughs> you know stuff like that. But it's better to have those conversations and be friendly than than to uh, to not. Yep. Everyone following me. Yeah. Well, is that exciting to see stuff like that, to see those numbers? Yeah. You should, you should be wiggling at this point. That's how I was. <laughs> so it goes back to this. Again, how, do you want to do it yourself, or would you like someone else to help you? And uh, that's kind of what we offer. Both, both ways are good. Like, I'm here to help. Carol is freaking amazing at finding properties. So if you want to go do it yourself, I'm going to point you to Carol. If you want to partner, that's more of my specialty, and then the property management. I run the property management company as well here. So I, I work with everybody, and we've already found the properties. We don't, you don't need to learn how to find properties. I already found them. They're sitting there with equity. We just need a buyer. And so what we do is we team up. You provide the money, the credit, and buy it. And then my end of the bargain is to manage it, and then we split, we split the increase, uh, 60% to you guys, 40% to me. So any increase. So let me let me show you an example of this. So this is a property I have under contract. Quail Hill, awesome townhome. It's a three bedroom with a nice loft, nice work area on the loft. Current market value is 300. Thirty-three thousand five hundred dollars. This is actually in your notes. Um, purchase. I have it under contract at three thirteen five hundred. We already have twenty thousand in equity on the thing right now. Um, this would be. This is about the reserve requirements that you would need for the Swan account, Sleep Well at Night account. This is your closing costs are generally two percent. This is a general. They can vary depending on what time of the month you close, but about two percent of your purchase price. Um, down payment, $20,000, so you need $77,970 to purchase this property. Now, if that sounds like a lot, what we also do here with partnering is we can partner with somebody who has, let's say they have 40, you have 40, we can all three of us buy it together. That way you're not missing out on the real estate game. So, because you can still get the high returns, but we can just partner together. And that's the only one way we help people buy more properties. It, you know, and if it's, you know, whatever the percent is, it, it'll work out. Okay, 
So we leverage it. Our loan is two hundred fifty thousand. Okay. Actually, what am I doing? I like totally did this here. I like it. Went through this whole thing. Okay. So this is that loan up. Okay. All right. So some of the assumptions was a three point eight five rate. Maybe I, depending on the lender. I know Edge Homes. Edge Homes has been quoting me, and actually I closed on my house at three point six two five. I could show you the documents. That was the most phenomenal rate. But really, right now, things have varied depending on the lender. And some are between four. Assuming we all under these circumstances, we're assuming you have like a seven hundred credit score. You're clean. You got the reserves. If any of those factors change, your rate can dramatically change. So, what well, the first steps you need to do is get pre-qualified so you know your financial strength. And that's where someone like Ryan, we say, go talk to Ryan. Because I don't, I don't approve of it. He does, and he can tell you exactly where you are or where you should be. So buying real estate is about preparing. You just don't save 80 grand. What usually happens is your home appreciates 80 grand. You refinance, take that, and then buy your property. That's how 90% of the people do it. Few people actually make the income. Either way, it works. So when you have the money, you you put it in, you invest it. Okay. So let's go to the next one. So next part here, this is this is gross income. So on this property, we feel we can rent it for seventeen hundred a month. Uh, I'm not showing utility income. It is pet friendly, but I just showed it without a pet. If I had a pet, I'm just accepting pets. I just like I said, I'm accepting that reality that we live in. Is everybody's got a pet, whether you like it or not, they're going to be in your property. So might as well just just I might as well make some money off it. I feel like the gross rents are a little. How much more would that be? Well, this is in Saratoga, so oh, okay. I can have, I have the same properties a little more, but in the exchange in Lehigh, I can almost get nineteen hundred for it a month. So it actually is really well. And down here in um, Vineyard, we have the same property. I have two properties that we can also invest in down there, and we're getting. Um, we went we went under ours at eighteen seventy five, and then I had a, a client who I told you should list yours at eighteen ninety five. He got it. And by the time ours close, I'm probably going to ask around 1925 a month for mine. Well, we have one's closing in August. We're getting 20. Yeah. What's the mortgage yeah. for that though? 1264. Yeah, whatever our purchase price is. Um, we uh, we also do scenarios where we do buy the room. So when I manage it, I can typically leverage more buy the room. And so why do I get these townhomes? Well, I get this particular kind because I have two parking in the garage and on the driveway. Where some townhomes where they go vertical, they have no driveway. So this is more a little more space, a little more room between the buildings. So we can we can get more. But on this one, uh, this is our this is our scenario. I'm showing you the conservative scenario, honestly, because we can sometimes make quite a bit more. Just out of curiosity, what about the pet income demand on it? Fifty bucks a month. Fifty bucks a month. Just curious. Yeah. And the utility the income is that like the owner pays for, I know in California, it's owner, I mean, the owner pays water and trash, is that the same here in Utah? Well, there's some things included in the HOA, I forgot exactly what, but uh, mm -hmm. I think the trash, sewer, water, sewer, trash. Do they trash. pay but, HOA or do we pay? HOA. Uh, we do we rent I, I pay it. I pay it. I want to be sure it's an HOA. It just depends on your contract. You can change it to however you want. Like you, you can bait people. Thanks for coming. You can bait people by showing a lower rent, but then I, I never like that tactic. I like just showing the full amount is what you pay. It honestly is more effective the other way, but I just don't like it. It, it does work. You making the nuts? It's not like you didn't disclose it. But. Oh, look at all the new builders, right? They bait you at the low prices. Yeah, those freaking edge homes, right? They bait you in at those low prices and all those, they do. all those upgrades. Jeez, it works. Mm -hmm. Those upgrades are so capable. Okay, you follow me here? Two percent vacancy is basically a turnover vacancy. It's not really a vacancy vacancy. I, I, there's too much demand right now. I'm not anticipating vacancy. The only a vacancy could be the initial, getting the initial person in, but once we have them in, we can rent it early enough that we're marketing early enough that we're getting tenants right now pretty easily. Okay, going to the third section, this is our expenses. So I'll tell you some of my assumptions in this, which is uh, Maintenance or repairs? I'm saying zero right now. Why? It's brand new. Brand new. It has a home warranty for the first year. Nice. But, and if something's broke, trust me, it didn't break on its own. It's the tenant who broke it, and I'm going to charge them for that, which equals out. 
Now, in the meantime, I need my Swan account because I'm going to have to pay for it and then charge it back. So you still need that reserve, but you'll get it back. And if they don't want to pay you, you got to reserve account. No. You try and work with people. But Take it out of the boat. Or you can set up a repayment plan, but you'll get it back. Okay, HOA fees is 105 bucks a month on this. This is my total management fee. Let me talk about this. So even though we're partners, I'm using Rise Utah Realty as a management company. And most individual management companies will charge you 10%. They charge you 10% of this, you'd be cash flow of negative. Um, I am doing a minimal cost, just literally just covering my, my employee costs. And what I'm paying for is your bookkeeping, the, the taxes, or not the actual taxes, but you know the, all the, everything related to the property, the reporting, the management, checking and having somebody go lease it, photography, it's all there. So that's kind of my, my break even rate. Um, so additional expenses, I don't know. <laughs> Something comes up, who knows? Um, we we find that we have to put knobs on our cabinets after we buy the thing. That's your five hundred bucks right there. Taxes is pretty close estimate. Insurance premium. Insurance premium is low here, and I'll tell you why it's low. It's because one is a townhome, and the HOA has a five thousand dollar deductible instead of like higher ten, fifteen, twenty. And having a low deductible means the insurance really only has to cover the inside of your unit up to five thousand dollars and the HOA takes over from that point. So literally I'd be $188 a year in home insurance. That's per year, it's my annual cost. And I talked to my insurance agent today and actually estimated a little higher because on my unit I pay one sixty five. So those are your total. So we have our we had our income. We make actually nineteen thousand nine hundred twenty ninety two dollars. We have our expenses um, our uh, debt service, which is the loan, so we make fifteen fifty six. This percent here is what percent of the total income you keep. It's only seven point five six. Okay. So moving on, we're going to this category. This is our depreciation expense. Remember, we said twenty seven and a half years. That's the value amount. Because why is it so high compared to the cost? Because there's really no end in town. It's not. It's not worth as much. So that's the amount uh, over of what do they call it, personal property within that, and it's taxed differently. But this is the these are the ratios, and so I'll show you the numbers where they apply. Okay, pro formas. Okay, the last last 27 and a half years, the average appreciation in, in Utah has been 4.8 percent over a, a 27 and a half year. Why do I say 27 and a half? We keep going with that number. Well, that's actually. The number of years the MLS has existed, because before that I didn't want to look at it in like microfish to, to find out what the uh, the average price was back in the day. So I'm assuming just a five percent increase a year, which is projected this year. But we know we we all know that the last nine years have been much higher than that. But I want to I want to go averages on this here. So here's our return analysis. Our cash flow, this is where people would be like, oh, I only made 2%. You just bought a brand new property and your cash flow. And someone else is doing it for you. Like, that's not bad. Okay, it's tight, but it's there. Okay. Your principal pay down is forty-five hundred dollars on this place. That equals per year investment another five point eight one percent return on the on the purchase. Your tax uh, decrease is worth two thousand dollars. That's based on a fifteen percent tax. If you had a higher rate, that could be much much greater. Um, that gives you another two point six eight percent. And then here's the kicker: you made thirty five thousand dollars your first year. One, we already have twenty thousand dollars in the property. And two is if you make another five percent, that's thirty five thousand dollars. You're going to make year one out of the gate. That's forty five percent return on your investment. You add those up. For it's the value, not cash, but the total value of really what you're getting in terms of real return. It is real money we're talking. It's $43,857. That's a 56.25% return on your investment. Now, to really appreciate this, I want to I share an economic principle with you called the Rule of 72. You need to understand this to really understand how, why so many people get ahead. Rule 72 is simply this. It's it's a way, it's a very simple way to determine 
how long it will take the investment to double. So if I if I invest ten thousand dollars, how long will how many years will it take to get to twenty thousand dollars? So the way it works is this. I have a checking account or savings account with Wells Fargo. I actually looked this up. My return is 0.01 percent. Damn. If you divide 0.01 divided by this number, it's going to take me 7,200 years to <laughs> double my money in my checking account. I think I would die before. That. If the inflation is the natural tendency of dollars to devalue. Uh, I don't honestly understand at all or why it happens, but basically the government prints money. money and the dollar changes value. So if I simply kept my money in my bank, I am losing. So our money, if I divide 3 by 72, um, oh that's wrong, I'm sorry. Oh no, yeah that is wrong. That should be uh, 24, that should be 24. That means every 24 years, uh, the, what used to be a dollar, now you need two dollars to buy, technically, right? So, so if I have stuff in my checking account, oh, or if I have cash in a bank at my house, I'm losing, like quickly. I'm really losing. Okay. If if you make a good five percent return, that's our average. So if you just bought real estate and made an average return, or let's say stocks, it'd take 14 years. So now you're ahead of the game. So you're ahead of the inflation game. That is the goal. You've got to get ahead of the inflation game. If you're behind that game, you will be broke. Here's my point here. The inflation in Utah is happening much higher than everybody thinks. Because your number one expense is real estate and it's going up so rapidly, inflation is going to kill people here. In the matter of another decade, so many people won't be able to live here in our state. That's why you're seeing we'll have to, have to go to the next Roosevelt. They're going to move out to Roosevelt, <laughs> Richmond, Richfield, or whatever it's called. They're going to go Ephraim. Ephraim's going to be the next big city. So they're going to have to go out to get the price set that they're going to look for. And that's natural. It happens. But if you bought in the epicenter of all this growth now, you'd be killing it. In the next 10 years. And that's one of the reasons why invest in multifamily stuff, because that's what builders are building, and that's like Carol was talking about the price point. You're staying below the median price average, and you're making a killing. So if we start to get higher, look at look at how fast your money doubles if you go higher. So if you're making a 10%, seven years. If you're making 24%, three years, you're doubling your money. 48%. One and a half. We are showing a 50%. Under two years, you've doubled your money. Okay, tell me who's going to get ahead of inflation. If you're making normal inflation, takes, again, this is 24, but if, if you're doing that in, let's call it two years, let's say two years you're doubling your money, that's, that's it. That's why so many people become millionaires. They figured out the math. It's simply just the math equation, they figured it out. And then they just buy. As soon as you have enough equity, what do you do? Talk to Ryan. You refinance. You pull it out. Buy your next property. Or if you don't want to refi, like you decide you've had enough of the property, you sell and then you buy two. But you're doubling. So as soon as you reach enough equity to take out enough money to buy another property, you do it. What we're saying and, and what we do in portfolio management for real estate is we set people up to get the mindset that every three to seven years, depending on market conditions, you do one of those. You sell or refinance. You move. So can you take out, or would you recommend taking out, let's say on your equity in your home, would you recommend taking out on, like refining and doing a cash out refi, or take it out of a HELOC? Right. So, we live in very interesting times. <laughs> Pre-COVID, the answer would be, let's do a cash out refinance. You get a fixed rate, a very low fixed rate, uh, on your primary residence, and you get access to your capital. However, COVID has changed the game. So, three weeks ago, I had three borrowers working on cash outs, and overnight, the lenders saw the unemployment rate, 
and they bailed out of the, if you didn't have a loan that was locked, they canceled your loans. So that is to say right now, to answer your question, you're going to have a better opportunity working with local HELOCs. So that's not something I specialize in, but I know a lot of families that are working with local banks, U.S. banks, got a good HELOC program. Typically you can go higher on the loan to value, right? right? Uh, higher LTVs, yeah. You guys understand what LTV is? Basically, it's the percent of the house value that's a loan versus what you own. So, so HELOCs are still a good option. So HELOCs, you can actually go higher on. You can actually take more cash out. But you will pay, the trade-off is a higher interest rate, and it's also adjustable. Right. But we know pressure right now is to keep that low, so it's not a huge risk, but it's there. And, but it's also a tax write-off, too, the interest. <coughs> yeah. The HELOC. Correct. So... I hope, you know, if you're on the fence, most people just, uh, they don't even give me a chance to explain it to them. And if they do, they don't trust realtors, you know, they're, ah, they're just <laughs> realtors, ah, can't stand them. <laughs> so, but, but I personally, like, came to that realization, I've been holding off, I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I've, I've seen prices go from 200000 on townhomes, and now they're like three thirty. I didn't take advantage of that. Like, you know how that feels? It sucks. You know, it's, it's, the, it's like the dream, would have, could have, but didn't. Should have, it's the, re, it's, the re, it's the regret. And you don't want to feel that. And, and most of it comes by fear. It's fear of not knowing where the market's gone. Luckily, when I became a realtor, I said, i got to figure this out. And so I really started studying the market. And what I figured out is, you see the sun setting right now? The sun is setting. How do we know? Is there indicators? Like, does it just go night all of a sudden? No, it, it kind of like starts on this side of the world and kind of makes its way over here. And as it does, the shadows change. And when it goes down, temperatures change. I, you know, you notice because now you need flashlights because it's not there. So when a market changes, there are signs. There are symptoms of a sick market and there are symptoms of a strong market. Even though we're in coronavirus, the symptoms are positive. Like... Because we're looking at low inventory, supply demand, it's pushing that. Low interest rates, which is purposely, that was Federal Reserve was purposely trying to get you to buy real estate, to get a loan. They want you to do business. They're tempting you with the lowest interest rates that we've had in a long, long time, if not ever. And then we're sitting here in the number one economy in the United States that by most professionals' predictions are is going to pull out first with people who want to work and we just happen to live in the number one area in the number one economy and it's not too pricey yet where we can if we invest and we invest quickly could take advantage of that to really fundamentally change your future your financial future so when we look at these things again on this pro forma alone, you're like, oh, no cash flow, I can hire my stocks. No, 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 no. You're, you're gonna make tons of money on this, don't worry. You know, this money, on this particular example, is doubling in 1.28 years. 15 months, you got double your money. But I'd rather have a new car, I like that Tesla. Go for it, man. You get your Tesla. I'm gonna buy real estate. Like, like that's just how I feel about it. Like. I'm living in my means so that I can take everything and funnel it into that. And why do we do it? Why invest in real estate? Because someday I'd like, like to retire. <laughs> someday I would like to not only replace my income through real estate, but actually exceed my income in real estate. Uh, and real estate is a very passive income. Passive meaning you don't have to actively do something every day to achieve it. Carol and I are partners. We have closed on two townhomes. We'll close on another two in August. And two more condos in December. All goes well on the construction. Um, without even closing, we made $100,000 on our properties. I've only closed on two. But like, if you look at the price increase, that's how much I've made on those six properties. I'm not kidding. That's probably the thing. I bought. I bought one at 302. It's now worth 340. I have two of those that I just closed on. 
condo. It was, it was really nice because yeah, as you know, the builders building it, we were just but like, as a appreciation. But just as a real estate broker, I see things you guys don't see. You just gotta trust me. Like, hey, like I just buy this, like, and so I built up rapport with some of my clients, and they just, I just kind of point them by it. When you buy townhomes, do you usually finish the basement or leave it unfinished? Okay, so I have I have three investment opportunities right now where I want to finish the basement. The problem is I don't have enough money to do it, so I need one of you to help me. <laughs> uh, the problem is, is uh, the deposits amount is too high for me to do it. But what would happen is with these three particular properties, they're right in front of the clubhouse, pool, facing it, beautiful 2,400 square feet. We're going to rent and buy the room, and we'll make 2400 a month. Our cash flow on those will actually 10% day one. But we got it. It's kind of a cash flow thing, too. Like your rent that you're going to get for that finished basement versus just. Right. So far, we haven't seen. We just so, rather so, just what find happens, the so, what happens is. You and get, you can usually finish them off cheaper yourself, too, mm -hmm. than having the builder do it. But so, it's it all, depends on the builder. It's all about leverage. These guys. Apparently they don't like to finish off basements because they charge us like twenty five thousand dollars to finish it. When well, almost, typically off market, all builders are that way though. You can you can get it, it for it. less. And, however, if you do it off market, you need the full amount as opposed to just twenty percent. So I was just like, whatever. It's just the cost of business. I'm just going to have to pay them. Um, but I've already kind of worked it out. We don't have to pay the whole deposit. We can only even. David's got it anyway, so he's given better deals than the average Joe. <laughs> I, I, well, I don't know if this is still true. I was, I was like the number, uh, if you look at total sales, I think I was the number two sales agent at Hedge. <laughs> I've sold 60 properties yeah. in six months. So, um, because we're just putting a ton in the contract because it works right now. Now maybe six months from now I'll tell you not to do that, but I'm just saying, there's this micro window where, like, well, this worked, and and the prices are still going up. In fact, just uh, one of the, one of the ways we know the economy, as far as it's working, is uh, uh, Stephen Bo, uh, Boo. I call him Stephen because I tell him I can't treat him seriously if I have to call him Boo. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, his nickname is Boo. I'm like, really? Uh, so, anyways, um, I said. Uh, I got sidetracked on the story, but uh, what was I talking about? Help me get me, get me back on track. You said if you, you right now it's good to do it, but in six months you might not, we might, you might not be able to do it because it's there now. Something like that. You're talking about you put it in the Oh, yeah. So, yes, thank you. So, um, during the coronavirus, when no one, when people kind of slowed down, took back, I went full in. And I put 35 homes on the contract. Full, full in because we had opportunities. Because I could buy a volume, I got $8,500 off to pay for the fourth bedroom, pay for upgrades. And then since then, it's appreciated another 8000 on top of that. So I got a combined 16000 off because I took advantage of an opportunity. And I can pass that on to you guys the savings. Like, partner, maybe we get like the instant equity we're talking about. So the the opportunities are there. They're not like like you're going to get 50% off on a property kind of opportunity, but there are little deals that we can get a little bit here, a little bit there, negotiate just a little better. And um, what happened recently with the price is this last Monday, I think it was Monday, they increased the price $4,000 on the town where they hadn't done a price jump like that. Prior to COVID, there was, a, it was about a two-month period. It was like, it's like seemed like every week it was like three thousand dollars, six thousand dollars, five thousand dollars. Every new release was mega, mega increases in price. Coronavirus hit; they went a month without a price increase. But then the last two months, they've been every other week a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars. Now, if you go a thousand dollars every other week, that's twenty-four thousand dollars on a property, which which is about an eight percent appreciation rate. So that's what they're going at, and they've slowed down. But then Monday, they jump it up $4,000. Why? Because on like 12 properties at the release date, they, they got 50 offers on 12 properties. Everyone sold multiple offers. 
where I was able to come in and we got, we got some deals where now they're not going to negotiate with us anymore. Why? Because they don't have to. They don't have to negotiate. So we have a window. We took advantage of it. Who knows if we'll be there in the future, but we've got some good things now. All right. So, um, so again, just to explain that, you got a pamphlet. Uh, your next your next steps are these. Really just decide what you want to do. You know, Do you feel like you're a do-it-yourselfer? I don't mean that with any disrespect because I do a lot of things myself. Or do you feel like, let's take advantage of some of these opportunities, let's partner up. You, know, you can do it yourself later, but, but I think we can add a lot of value to what you do. And, and most of all, the number one reason why people don't invest in real estate, they don't want to be a landlord. It just sucks. They're like, I just don't want to do it. I mean, if you, I'm, I'm, I'm serious, like, you have to, like, be there on a Friday night when something's wrong. It doesn't or, matter where the world is. Or have people that can be there on a Friday night. That's really handy. Yeah, but you can't <laughs> afford that when it's just you, because you're, you know, you eat your money up really quickly that way. So, but, you know, we'll do, uh, prior to closing, we'll pretty much have a lease in place and get it going. So, any questions on, on this? Or anything else I've said tonight? Do you have a good question? Yeah. So, how long have you been a landlord? Uh, since 2008. So, how many students did you manage on that? I moved to Utah because my brother wanted to invest in real estate. He sold a tech company, made a ton of money, and he wanted help investing. I was his real estate and also his property manager. Half, let's fast forward. That lasted for ten years or so, eight years actually. So, after eight years, I met with someone else and local on-site managers. We managed one thousand eight hundred fifty-six tenants, and it was over three hundred units, mostly student housing, high intense property management. And we had on-site managers. We trained. We owned properties. BYU, UVU. BYU Idaho um, and Orem condos and stuff and some office buildings. I managed them all. So that's where I really got my management experience, learned the, the market, and then, then I decided to break off and, and kind of long story short, started my brokerage five years ago, been helping people buy and invest in real estate. And just recently I started like I'm trying to help solve people's objections and problems they have with real estate. One is, the, the number one is always um, being a landlord. Like, like, that's why some people who like real estate would rather buy a REIT, real estate investment trust, through the stock market. That's how they think they're investing in real estate. But the returns aren't even close to the same. The guys who are buying into real estate are making the 60% returns, and then they're turning around giving you the 10% with your money. But you really want to take advantage. I mean, even at our splits, you're still making a 34% return. So, so before the two, like the two townhomes you're closing on in like the spring, did you own any properties, rental properties, or are you just managing and like brokering other deals? Well, I was a partner and that with oh, my brother. Okay. Yeah, and then I basically left that and now I've been building my own. Okay. And Carol and I. Carol was part of that. And the 100 properties she had, that was outside of that. And yeah, so the oh. I like them so. closer. I am like all over the country, yeah, and it was really hard. Well, oh, yeah. So like you know, I had a four-unit complex out in Iowa, you know, with all these migrant workers, and we had bed bugs, and I mean, like I've been through the of everything. You gotta be there. I've been a little <laughs> long-winded. I've kind of lost track of time. I know it's nine o'clock. I said we'd be done at nine, but let me just say, what's the end game? Yeah, what's the end game? And this is what I want to propose. That the the end game is to replace. Then exceed your monthly income and retire. That's yeah. mine. That's I, that's kind of how they describe mine, like in the simplest way. The more the younger you are, the nicer this will look. But let me show you an example of what's possible. Here's my assumption. One is average appreciation of five percent. If you have five percent, you put twenty percent down, you're making thirty-five percent a year on your property. That means in five years you have actually plenty of equity to buy another property. So you could actually do this faster, but let's just say for simplicity, five years. Okay. 
Now, obviously, you're going to buy this. If you own or occupy, you can get it um, even cheaper. You can get it even cheaper. I'm helping a guy. We partnered owner occupied. Say, why would you partner owner occupied? Because I paid all of his closing costs. We split it. He can live as long as he wants. He can take me off title. I really don't care. Just as long as when that happens, we just split it. But I've enabled him. But we're going to be well on our way. But he was able to buy it for a lot less money down. So, but with as a as an investment property, let's say twenty percent down, you get that. And once you get that, after five years, you can either keep it or and then buy another. So you would have two properties. Or um, you would sell it, depending on the property, and you know we analyze that every year to say, how's it going? Is it having more repairs than what we thought? Has it been? Is it the return? Or do we see that we need to migrate to a higher return area again to get what we're looking for? And that would be one of the main reasons to to migrate to another area by selling. But I'm not saying that because I like what you're listing. I'm saying that I like I want, I want you to build a portfolio, and this is how you're going to do it. So. Five years later, what do we do? Okay. Doubles. So in five, in ten years, I would expect you to have four properties or more, okay, depending on the market conditions. So we just take this out. This is where it gets, starts to get really exciting, because the power of doubling is that each year, you know, you, each five years, you can continue to do these things until. In 25 years, you have 32 properties. Now that he's here about the loans, and how does that work? So let's say you, you have your own home, and then you purchase a second home to rent, and then five years later, you're talking about yeah. a yeah. That's a good question. I've simplified this a little bit, but we would actually do, it'd be a little more complex than this, because you can't actually have 32 residential loans. You're actually capped at 10 residential. So what we start doing is, remember in the very beginning we said, why don't we buy multifamilies? Because typically, you can't afford it. Most people, you know. So once you start to get these levels, we can get 10 properties. And there's a couple things you could do. One is, there are, there are lenders out there that will conglomerate all properties into one loan. Or, you just get a 10plex, right? Or we develop something. Like there's other plans that we can do. So there are other type of loans that... The yeah. the it's, we go to commercial financing, okay. and the assumptions would be you have other types of loans and properties and properties, right? But the interest rate is expected to be a little higher, right? And, well, a multifamily commercial is actually really good. Uh, it is a little higher, but not too much. But there's, we can talk more about that uh, when we get there. So. But yeah, but but it's good to, to know those things and your options. Do you guys feel like this is possible now? So you kind of see this outlaid? It really is. And that's what I, I hope, anything I've empowered you to believe that it's possible. It's just not, this is not crazy math. This is actually fairly realistic. This is, not fairly, it is realistic. I'm being actually realistic in these. I think a lot of people could do it actually faster. Like if you did it over the last nine years, this would have been way faster. Because you're appreciated almost 20%. Thanks for coming. Thank you. 20% in two years. That's just insane. Okay? So, uh, how many people want to be there? Yeah. Yeah. Carissa in the back, she's totally. <laughs> she's, she's, she works here. She's, so, we'll get back to that. Should you buy? Yeah. I, I, I do believe it for all those reasons. Okay, so. Um, we would love to talk more if you guys have more questions. Um, like really the next steps for us would be like, <clears throat> if you want to invest, is really sitting down with a consultation so we can really understand your personal plans, needs, timeline. If you're not ready for that, hopefully what you can get out of this is that it takes planning. So what I typically say is even if you're not ready, let's sit down because we can set, we can give you more of a framework to plan. Uh, even even going as far as getting pre-approved by a lender because he needs to analyze and really give you like I could tell you something but maybe you didn't disclose to me that you have a 600 credit score you know <laughs> so that happens all the time I will not show properties if you haven't got pre-approved because I just I just learned too often that there's a reason why you're not doing it so appreciate you guys thank you thank for you. coming Yay.